Um, thank you very much indeed. First of all, I want to thank everybody for the opportunity of speaking here today. Um, it's, it's a great honour and I want to spend the next 15 minutes, I suppose, sharing my journey with you going back to when I began in 04 and looking at what I've learned along the way um, and I hope it's, it's of interest to you. I suppose when I started taking part in the teaching and learning um, initiative, I came to it from a very different environment to the other speakers. I work in a hospital environment. Uh, we were very much clinical based and even though we had students, uh, teaching the students was considered to be a very minor part of our activities. We were meant to fit it in around as uh, patient care came first. Um, I started looking at my teaching when I had my own children and it struck me I was, I was taking my children from the age of two to Montessori and to schools where they were being taught by teachers that were trained and yet I was teaching in a university where the students were being taught by people who had no teacher training whatsoever and that included myself. I started teaching because uh, one day there was a lecture to be given and the person who was meant to give it couldn't do it so I was told right you were doing it and that was the training I was given. Um, and I suppose like a lot of the people I've spoken to, when you start teaching in that kind of a situation, you start to wonder, am I doing it right? Am I doing it wrong? And how do I know if, if everybody else is doing it better than me? So when the initiative started here, I initially did the use, the, uh, there was a course offered, which was from Harvard, which was the wide course in TFU, Teaching for Understanding. I did that. And I, I, I found that really interesting because I met people from all walks of life who were teaching students of all ages from kindergarten up and I discovered we all shared the same, I suppose, underlying questions and underlying problems with all our students across every different discipline. So this is particularly important, I think, moving into this century, 21st century, and I've seen more than one century. And um, we have a huge amount of challenges now, I think. We, we have a very educated student, they're very IT savvy, they have great expectations, their parents have great expectations. If you teach in a clinical environment, you have accreditation bodies who have expectations. We have moved away from the idea that students should ought to sit quietly and listen to us while we deliver the words of wisdom and expect nothing from them in return. So we've moved away from the standard formal lectures uh, to a more integrative approach to learning. Um, students are also changing, they're becoming much more diverse. We have mature students, we have students from different disciplines, different backgrounds, and we have a lot of overseas students here. We have students coming to Ireland from Africa, from Canada, um, from Malaysia, from all over the world. So each coming from their own particular cultures with their own concepts of how they should learn and how they should engage with us. Um, so, and even in relation to the patients that we treat, patients now have information at, at their easy access. So, so we find patients are coming to us uh, with an issue and they have looked it up on the internet. So they're coming with their expectations as well. So we as faculty have to change to, I suppose, take on board all these changes. And we have two options. We can actually come along with these changes or we can flounder and as an institution we can die. I think that is a problem that's facing many, many colleges in lots of different countries. How to adapt to the modern world, to all the expectations that are being placed upon us as faculty, and how do we manage to meet all these expectations and still manage to stay a little bit sane in the process. So in order to adapt and to be successful in this, I think institutions have to have the cooperation of all the faculty members. People have to buy into this need to adapt. And the faculty have to engage with educational reform. We can't just say, well, I'm teaching this way because I always taught this way and I'm not changing. So we have to get the faculty to come on board with us and to be willing to engage in faculty development. And again, for me, coming from my background of being, a, I suppose, working clinically for the past 30 years, we had our own ways of doing things. And if we had education, it was only clinical education, new skills, new techniques. We were given no educational uh, assistance in relation to that part of our, our role. And I thought this was an excellent uh, definition of what faculty development ought to be. And you see that I've underlined certain words. It, it's meant to be a tool for making the academic institution more alive, more vital, 
and it's also looking at the competencies that individual teachers need and also it also says about the importance of the institution having policies in place that promote uh, um, individuals to excel academically. So all the other speakers have spoken about student learning. I'm going to look at staff learning and staff needs. So it's a slightly different um, attitude towards it. So what I did was I looked at the whole idea of dental professional development in relation to educational needs and I asked myself was it really in existence, was it a myth or was it reality? And looking at the literature, which is what we always do when we start any project, I saw that there was a lot of negative comments out there and this was one that was in 03 which was saying the lack of attention to faculty development is very commonplace in all aspects of university teaching. And this was going through not only the health sciences, but from arts, humanities, everywhere, that there was no emphasis being placed on that a decade ago. And looking at it in relation to my own area, which is dental education, you can see that the quotations were not very favourable either, that we looked upon educational theories as being only gobbledygook, which is Irish for nonsense. So um, I went and started looking at this as, as my research idea to look at what education, um, I suppose what the attitudes of Irish dental faculty members were in relation to education, to see what level of engagement they had, whether they had any interest, what they'd already done, what they'd taken part in, what they thought were the barriers that were stopping them from taking part in it, if any. And this had never been explored before in Ireland and not much was explored internationally either. So I'm not going to give you much information about the thesis uh, because I'm just going to touch on it briefly, but basically we have two dental schools here in Ireland, one here in Cork, which as you know is the real capital of Ireland, and the other one is in the alternative capital, which is in Dublin. Uh, we have a staff of 130 roughly, which is going from every level, from the actual dean, the professors, all the way down to the different levels, looking only at the teaching faculty. Uh, the school here in Cork is slightly smaller than the school in Dublin, but size isn't everything. Um, what I did was a postal survey, which was a mixed meta study. Some of it was quantitative, and again, some of it was qualitative. I wanted people's views, I wanted their attitudes, their opinions, not just numbers. Uh, I had a reasonable response rate, which was 64%, very high response rate in Cork because I tormented them. And again, there was the standard types of analysis done. These are just the variables that I looked at. You can see there was quite a wide range of variables. I won't go through them. Again, just looking at the basic findings, I found that most of the staff were at least over 40, and in relation to the professors, 90% were over 50. Uh, again, there was an interest interesting gender mix. 85% of the, those that were in their 30s were male, and 64% of the overall series were male, and in relation to the professors, 85% were male. And this is not an Irish trend, this is a universal trend in relation to dental academics, that they tend to be male dominated and, and tend to be in the, shall we say, the more mature years, like myself. Um, so looking at the different grades, it was also interesting to see that the backbone of dental education is actually being um, extremely much laid on the part-time clinical staff. These are staff that work in their own practices mainly and come in and teach as part of their job. Um, then this was almost half of the staff, whereas people that were full-time academics, people like professors, were only roughly one-tenth of the academic staff. And this is of relevance later. So looking at the actual overall professional qualifications that they had, we saw that overall the faculty were, were actually very well clinically qualified, as you can see here, and they had a lot of clinical experience. Roughly three quarters have been actually working for over, over 10 years, and a lot of them had been working for over 20 years clinically, so they knew a lot about dentistry, which was reassuring. When you look at the time that they had spent since the last time they had personally engaged in anything educational, that wasn't quite so good because roughly half of them had not actually done any academic course for over 10 years, and almost one-fifth had not engaged in education themselves personally for over 20 years. And again, this was inversely related to age and also to rank. The older you got and the higher up you went, the less likely you were to personally have put your own toes in the water and educated yourself further. So in relation to teaching experience, again, we found that overall the staff were relatively experienced in relation to teaching. Over half of them have been teaching for at least 10 years. 
and again the younger staff had obviously been teaching less time and those that were part time. So I asked them as well had they had any educational training and a very high response rate, 91 said yes of course we've been taught how to teach. And then you asked them exactly what type of programmes they engaged in and most of them were just an, an informal kind of one evening's lecture or maybe a, a very short course they had taken and only 11 people out of the almost 150 had actually any academic uh, specific qualification in relation to teaching and out of those 11 I'm happy to say that 10 were from Cork. Um, when I asked them as well whether they knew of any specific programmes that were out there to assist them with their educational training um, only one third of them knew that there was any programme in existence and this was two or three years after we had started up the actual specific training programmes here in Cork and actually one quarter were adamant that there was nothing at all out there that was open to them which was of interest as well. So again this is just showing graphically the large number of people that thought that they had been educationally trained but basically when you ask them for the specifics very few of them had, had actually attended any programme that was accredited or that was formalised. I asked them as well what support they had been given in relation to um, their own teaching needs and helping them to be good teachers and they said frankly none. Um, a lot of people really were quite disillusioned and were quite, they felt quite isolated that they needed help, that they wanted help but they weren't getting it. Um, here the staff in Cork, they did recognise the introduction of this art and also the course here that was being run in this establishment. Uh, which was started off, I uh, say, but by people like Betty and Marion and Anya Highland. And since the institutions had started those programmes in 2004, people had recognised that there was assistance and this was very helpful to them. Um, they were also asked if they felt that the concept was a valid concept, if, if staff should actually be educated, should be given support in relation to faculty development in education. And almost 100% of the staff said, of course, people should be supported in this way. Only 75% though said that they wanted it personally, that they would be willing to go. Um, roughly half felt it should be compulsory for all, but a lot of those said it should be compulsory for everybody else but them. It should be compulsory for anybody new that was joining the faculty, but not for existing staff, which was somewhat interesting. Interest higher among, um, among younger staff, among those that had less experience in teaching, less than 10 years, those that had recently been graduated with a degree, no matter what age they were, and also among females. Less interest was shown in relation to older men over 50 and those that have been teaching for more than 30 years. And this is actually in line with what is in the literature because it shows that when people have been teaching for 30 years, they do suffer from fatigue, there can be burnout, there can be an attitude, I'm going to retire in five years' time, you know, there's no point in me learning new ideas now. It's, it, it's also interesting to know that those that do engage in it, though, they can become revitalised in their in the, that aspect of their career. Um, it's also interesting to note that very few people actually, uh, actually said that they believed that engaging in any form of faculty development would help them in relation to getting promotions or helping them to get um, upgraded in their job either within UCC or elsewhere. So the motivation that they gave for wanting to take part in teacher training was to improve themselves to improve their confidence, to feel that they were better teachers, to know that they were doing a good job. Because we all teach in isolation. We go into a room, us and the students, and nobody else watching. So we have no way of getting any validation in relation to whether we're doing a good job or whether we're doing a hopeless job. Students might be learning from the books when they go home, you know? Um, so as I said, most of the people that wanted to engage in extra training, we're doing so to, uh, I say, A, to work on their confidence and to become better teachers, not because they thought that they were going to gain financially or that they were going to get promoted because of it. So these are just some of the quotes. I want to become a better teacher. At, at the moment, I'm only using the techniques that I learned or, or that were used when I was a student, when I was being taught. So it was interesting as well that people's needs were altered as well by the rank that, that they were in. Uh, people that were actually part-time clinical tutors, they wanted to have assistance to be taught how to be more effective 
in their clinical teaching. Those that were full-time, they were faced by an increasing burden of coping with admin work, administrative work, um, assessments, all that kind of thing. And the staff that were at the senior level, they weren't interested in seminars or giving feedback. They wanted to know how to do assessment properly. So I asked them as well, what were the barriers that they felt were being placed in their way in relation to getting training to become better teachers? And these were the, the various things that they listed. Excessive teaching loads, excessive admin, research obligations. I need to juggle all these balls and keep them in the air. And I'm sure everybody, whether you're from Cork or from Kosovo, has the same problems. We have multiple expectations being placed on us. You must write papers, you must teach, you must correct, you must supervise students, you must mentor. How do we find time to do it all? And this was, uh, I say, what the staff were telling me as well. Um, again, these are just some of the comments in relation to what the staff actually felt in 0506 that the emphasis was not placed on the quality of teaching. This was not how you get rewarded, it was research output was what counted. Um, it, so it was looked upon as being a very small part of what we do. Um, so these were the conclusions that I came to at the end of my thesis was that overall the dental faculty, we were very well trained to be dentists, but we weren't necessarily very well trained in the other aspect of our job, which was to be teachers. Most of them had had no or almost no training at all in relation to how to teach. We were doing it off the cuff, just doing it the best that we could. We knew of our deficiencies, we knew of a lack of training, and they felt unsupported and not also aware of what supports were in existence even there. And this was leading to stress and to frustration and to issues in relation to retention and recruitment. This is not a problem that's only Irish, this is a problem that is universal in relation to dental faculty, and I feel it isn't only in relation to dental faculty, I think it's a problem in relation to getting university teachers worldwide when we have to compete with industry where they can offer better salaries, better conditions, you know, it is something that must be taken into consideration. Moving on one decade later, because as I said, I started in 04, we're now, uh, I suppose, celebrating a very important birthday. And I said, when I started in 04, I was one of, of only four people that had engaged in the faculty development. Looking over the years, we can see there has been a huge uptake in relation to both the certificate, the diploma, and the master's. These are just the student numbers from the small dental hospital where I work of students that have engaged with Alambara and, and have successfully completed the courses here. And you can see there has been quite a considerable engagement. For our size, we really have done very well. Um, and I think. Out of that, what's actually happening is that we now have our own little community of scholars out there which can support each other. I should also have mentioned, sorry, that the dental hospital where I work is situated about three miles away, I think, roughly from, I uh, say, outside the campus. So we have difficulty getting in and out. We are isolated both in terms of the fact that we have a clinical role, we have students, we have patients to see, so we have a very busy overall curriculum. And we are also off campus, which was which is actually a bit of an issue for us in relation to us actually feeling part of the UCC campus. So just looking at the numbers, as I said, we've had 37 people do the certificate, we've had 25 do the diploma, and we have had eight have, have actually got the, the masters. And it's also interesting to see that the numbers are higher in the cert. Um, there's also, the numbers are also higher among, uh, I'd have to say, among females. And also the part-time staff have particularly engaged in this, doing it in their own time with no reward financially whatsoever. So I think from that little acorn that was planted by Marion and Betty, uh, I think a reasonable size oak tree has grown. So I asked my own master students that I have supervised out there, why did they engage? Why did they bother when they weren't being paid? They thought they weren't to go to get promoted and they knew it wasn't going to get them a better job anyplace else. Why did you take part? And this is some of the feedback I got was because uncertainty. We teach in isolation, we go into our lecture theatre, we close the door behind us and we don't know whether we're doing it right or wrong. So I suppose to help us to know if we're doing a reasonable job, to answer this uncertainty, to expand our knowledge, to give some structure to our teaching so that we have, um, I suppose, strong overall basic knowledge in the educational theory so that we, we can know what we're talking about, know where we're coming from. 
again, also staff felt that, the, the, that it was good for them to get a qualification so that they could be more confident in themselves standing up in front of students. They also felt that the feedback from other students that had engaged in earlier years encouraged them to take part. I asked them what they gained from the process and again they gained in confidence, they got a language of how to talk about their teaching because this was all new to all of us. We came from a very different background. We talk about teeth, we talk about these kind of things, we don't talk about issues like epistemologies and all these smashing words that Marion spouts out easily. It dispelled doubt in, in our own I suppose, overall confidence and ability. We got ideas from others. It was great to come to UCC to share with our colleagues, to hear that we all had the same problems and to learn other people's ideas as to how they overcame them. Um, has it changed their teaching? Yes. Um, in some ways it changed the teaching, but I thought one excellent, excellent comment I got back was that it wasn't changed, that it hadn't changed their teaching, but it, it had changed how she had thought about her teaching. Um, that it had made her come, um, stand back, it made her be more reflective, that instead of always jumping in and taking over from the students, um, that it had allowed them space to stand back and let the students struggle with the problem maybe a bit longer, again linking back to the idea of allowing our students to have silence, to have time to reflect and to sort a problem out themselves. So the support that they got, they found they got fantastic support here from UCC, Malaysian on a borough, um, but within the hospital there's still a lot of work to do because um, this is still kind of seen as an extra activity which you can take on if you wish. So I suppose those are just a little bit of my thoughts in relation to the Master's Voice and I hope it's of interest to you. I've only given you a very light scattering of it. If anybody wants any more detail you can ask me. Thank you. Thank I hope I kept so on time. Much. That's a wonderful glass of voice.